Well, dear brothers and sisters, this is a fascinating subject. Uh, Sister Angela kept on asking me all last week, you know, have you nearly finished Rahab? And I kept on saying, yes, nearly finished. But then I'll discover another aspect and another aspect. And on Sunday I had to confess, I don't think this will ever get finished. There is so much hidden beneath the surface in this story. It's an absolutely fascinating one. And of course, the story of Rahab is inextricably linked with the history or the story of the two spies and she's one of at least three gentile women who are appear in the genealogy of our lord jesus christ she was a woman of exceptional faith and one of only two named in hebrews chapter 11 only she and sarah are mentioned in that chapter of faith so an outstanding woman of faith so her name occurs uh, eight times in scripture, uh, in the chapter that we read, it occurs twice, and in chapter six, which is the uh, deliverance of her uh, when the city falls, in chapter six is mentioned three times, and then there are three references in the New Testament. And there are three mentions of Rahab in Psalms and Isaiah, but I don't think there's any connection at all with our Rahab. It's used as a cipher for Egypt. So let's start by looking at the last two of the New Testament reading uh, passages that mention her. Hebrews chapter 11 mentions her, because this is a chapter of faith, mentions her faith. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she received the spies with peace. But James takes the same incident of Rahab and uses it to show justification by works. It was by her works that she did that she was justified. And plucks out Rahab as an outstanding example of works. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and had them sent out another way. And we know that faith and works go hand in hand. They're complementary. We go back to... Genesis, and we have Adam and Eve, complementary, and faith and works are two sides of one coin, aren't they? Can't have faith without it being revealed in the deeds that we do, and we can't do the right deeds unless we have faith. They are complementary, one with the other. So, hence the two references to Rahab in the New Testament, one showing her faith, the other showing her works. The other reference, of course, is in the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1. And this really is the key that opens up the story of Rahab. Without what is described here, we wouldn't know that she was the one who married uh, Salmon, who was the progenitor of King David. In the genealogies in the Old Testament, the ladies aren't mentioned, just the men. So we have Salmon and Boaz and so on to David. And it, we have to wait 1,600 years before the scripture opens up that actually the wife of Salmon was uh, uh, Rahab. And so this then opens up a, a wonderful field. So she not only saved her life, but she married the prince of Judah uh, and was in the line of the Lord Jesus Christ. It also explains the... Uh, graciousness of Boaz. Boaz just suddenly appears in the context of the book of Ruth. Now, now we know that Rahab, the great woman of faith, was her mother, his mother. Then that explains you know, what a wonderful character he was. And it also helps us to understand the high rank of Jesse. Which again, if we hadn't got this reference that he was in the line, the firstborn of Judah that we wouldn't understand from the Old Testament records just what an important person Jesse was. So, little things that are opened up because of this little few words, Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. So, to understand the story of Rahab, we have to go back to Genesis chapter 38. So, come with me to Genesis chapter 38. And if you know your chapters in Genesis, Genesis 38 is just one of those chapters that you feel, well, why on earth is this chapter here? Why is it in the word of God? 
we, we have the exciting story of Joseph. He's been taken by his brothers. He's been sold into slavery. He arrives at Egypt. What's going to happen to him? And then suddenly, chapter 38 is intruded. We have to wait till 39 to see that, yes, God was still with Joseph. Uh, and chapter 38 is all about Judah and Judah's sons and the evil of his sons and Tamar and begetting children, uh, Tamar by her father-in-law. And um, we say, you know, what was all this to do with it? But in fact, this chapter is one of the key chapters to understanding Joshua chapter 2. Because the two children that are born, the twins that are born, if we follow their genealogies, we will find that both of them are linked with the taking of Jericho and play an important role. So, let's just uh, look at the genealogy. Judah marries a Canaanitish woman, uh, the daughter of Shua. He begets Ur and Onan. Ur marries Tamar. Uh, Tamar presumably was not an Israelite, was a Canaanite. And they have no children. Ur is slain because he's wicked. Uh, Tamar is given to Onan for Onan to raise up seed to his brother. He refuses to do that, so he too is slain. And she's told to go home and wait till Sheila has grown up and then uh, maybe she can have children via Sheila. And time goes on. Sheila grows up, not given to her. So Tamar... I believe she was a woman of great faith. She understood the promises and the importance of the genealogy that Ur uh, needed a descendant to be, carry on the rights of the firstborn. And we know how she took matters into her own hands and begat children uh, by Judah himself, her father-in-law. And those two twins, the d- birth is described in quite a few verses, quite a lot of detail. And again, one says, you know, why all this detail of these twins, Perez and Zahra, the one putting his hand out and the cord being put round and then withdrawing his hands and his brother coming out first. So the one that appeared to be the firstborn wasn't actually the firstborn. And so we're introduced to these twins and we're introduced to the scarlet thread that is put round the wrist of the one that was supposed to be the firstborn. Now, if we go on six generations, we come to Salmon. Salmon, we're going to propose, is one of the two spies. But he was the prince of Judah, the firstborn of Judah, um, but six generations on. And he is the one we know from Matthew chapter 1, Marez Rahab. Now, if we go six generations from his twin, uh, Pharisee's twin brother, Zara, we get to Achan. The Achan, who was the one who took stuff from Jericho, brought trouble when they went to uh, Ai and brought disaster upon Israel. And the Chronicles account, 1 Chronicles 2, verses 7 and 10, brings the two people together. Salmon, the prince of Judah, it says, Achan, the troubler of Israel. So coming back to these uh, two twins are these two people who are associated with Jericho and the destruction of Jericho. And that's why I believe the scarlet thread, as we shall see, is going to play an important role. We know that Salmon and Rahab uh, eventually will come to King David himself. So what do we know about Salmon? He was a prince of Judah. We know from Matthew that he marries Rahab. And I believe that he was one of the two spies that were sent to Jericho. You see, 38 years earlier... Joshua had been one of the 12 spies that had been sent to spy out the land. And he and Caleb uh, came back. They were the original faithful spies. Caleb was the head of Judah uh, and Joshua the prince of uh, Ephraim. And so it makes sense if Joshua now is in the position where he now is the leader. Moses has now died. He's got to send spies to spy out the land. To send one from each of the tribes uh, that uh, were faithful spies 38 years earlier. Um, So the the evidence hopefully will build. It it makes sense. 
So just bear with me on that. So what do we know about Rahab? Well, she was a Gentile. She was an inhabitant of a royal city. There was a king in Jericho. Uh, so it was an important city. And uh, I believe as we read the account, we'll get the implication that she wasn't young. Now, if anybody is a Hebrew expert, might uh, understand better you know, the chapter in the original. But it, it does appear that from what... Uh, she says about the crossing of the Red Sea that she is saying it as if she had heard with her own ears about the deeds that happened 38, 40 years, 40 years earlier when the Israelites had come out of the land of Egypt and had crossed the Red Sea. So if that was the case, then she must have been in her 50s. So that may or may not be a, a correct deduction. We know that she has father, mother, brothers and sisters alive in the city and evidently she has no children because when she was pleading with the spies she mentions father, mother, brothers and sisters but doesn't mention anything about children so we have to conclude that she had no children. And she was an harlot. Now in the Hebrew the word for harlot can mean one that keeps an inn but the New Testament usage of the same word harlot in the Greek is, is uh, you know, there's no escaping. She was an harlot. And the, the, uh, the Matthew account records that Jesus says, you know, the publicans and the harlots will go into the kingdom of God before you. And uh, Revelation 17 verse 5 describes the great harlot that sits upon the beast. Same word. So that was her profession. So she was a woman who listened and understood and developed a tremendous faith which resulted in works. Now at this time the children of Israel were encamped in Shittim just on the other side of uh, the River Jordan um, just probably about three miles away from Jericho. Jericho is on a mound they would certainly be able to see across uh, to the camp of Israel. Today, the modern Jericho is to the south of where the ancient city of Jericho is. So it's about two miles to the north uh, of modern Jericho is the remains of the ancient Jericho. Now Rahab's faith is unquestionable. She is selected as the great example of faith. And so we have to ask the question, she told lies. We know that, the record doesn't gloss over it, that she deceived the king's messengers uh, and said, no, they've, uh, they came, yes, but they have gone. And so we have this interesting conundrum. Here is a woman of outstanding faith, but she was prepared to lie in order to save lives. And we have quite a lot of examples of lies being told in order to save lives. And we can think of King David himself, again a man beloved of God. He told Jonathan to lie to Saul about uh, his father had called him to Bethlehem, that's why he wasn't at the feast. He lied when he went to the high priest saying, I've come on the king's business and it's urgent, can you give me weapons? Uh, he lied to Achish. Uh, uh, and he, when the rebellion of Absalom, he, he told Hushai, his friend, to go back to Jerusalem and pretend to be a friend uh, to Absalom. So we have examples of men who spoke lies. And the interesting thing is that the, in all those cases, God doesn't pass judgment. There's no hint of God saying that is wrong. Where God does say lying is wrong is when, like Peter, in order to save his life, he denied his Lord. Now, David was not denying his God when he told lies to save his life. And I think that, that's the vital difference, that we have to leave judgment to God. He knows our hearts. And so um, Rahab did tell lies in order to save the spies. 
Now they came in the evening time we read so the, the, the king's messengers said that they came tonight and these men were seen to come in. So it makes sense, the spies, these two men had come to Jericho and came in the evening time when people will be returning from their fields and so that will be a good time to just mingle with the crowds going back homewards uh, to their city and the watchmen probably been on watch all day were growing a bit tired. So they went in the evening time but we know that they were seen. Later on, we're told in Joshua chapter 6 that Jericho was straightly shut up. And I believe that this, this wasn't the case at this time. It was after Israel had crossed the River Jordan and were encamped at Gilgal, which was uh, very close to Jericho, that that's when the gate was straightly shut up. At this time, people will be coming in and out of the gates. Why seek out a harlot's house? And I put a question mark after seek out because the account doesn't actually tell us that they sought out a harlot's house. It tells us that they went and came to a harlot's house. So whether they went deliberately, knowing that she was a harlot, or not, the account doesn't make clear. And we would understand that there weren't holiday inns and that kind of thing around in these days. We know from... Uh, slightly later time period, the time period of the judges, that uh, people, travellers, waited at the city entrance, waiting for people to say, well, come and stop at my house. So there doesn't seem to have been any system of um, organised lodging places. So it, it makes sense for them to go to a harlot's house because... Men would constantly be going in and out, so it wouldn't be anything remarkable. Uh, and how would they know that this was an harlot's house? We're not told. Maybe Rahab sat outside her front door, plying her wares, we know not. But her house was on the city wall, and for the spies, having gone in and been afraid whether they were going to be seen... Rahab's house would seem to be an ideal house. It was on the wall, uh, so didn't have to go close into the city. And uh, they went <coughs> to her and sought lodgings there. That's what they were after. They weren't interested in her services. They wanted a lodging for the night, and that's what she offered them. And we can be sure that Rahab in talking to these men outside her door and agreeing to terms of how much it would cost to spend the night there, she would observe that they were being observed. Because it seems that the first thing she does as they go into the house is to hide them. She is aware that the city is on edge. They're afraid of the Israelites. They know what the Israelites have done around the uh, eastern side of the River Jordan. And they're in fear of their lives. And so there would be a lot of tension, uh, a lot of observing who comes and who goes. How it was that those that witnessed them coming into the city and how Rahab herself knew that they were Israelites, again, the record is silent. But somehow they were identifiable. Whether their dress was slightly different, whether their accents, uh, you know, their language um, obviously would be different. They didn't speak the Canaanite language, but they must have, must have known the Canaanite language to go as spies because you'd need to know the language. Whether it was their weather-beaten faces because they had been wandering 40 years in the wilderness, um, they would be very weather-beaten. But both Rahab and people who had seen them come in through the gates realised that they were Israelites. And this is where the faith of Rahab is seen. She had been pondering how she could get in touch with Israelites. She knew that they were under sentence of death. She recognised their God as the mighty God. Uh, and she was desperately, no doubt she had prayed uh, to Israel's God, hoping that somehow... Uh, her life could be spared. 
So she seems to, as soon as they came into the house, she recognised the danger that they were in, that they had been seen, and she takes them up onto the uh, roof um, and hides them. And we see this is where her faith shows. So it tells us it was she got flax, and that shows the correctness of the account. Flax is harvested around Passover time. We're seven days before the Israelites will be holding their Passover, so we're in April. Uh, and just a little phrase, she, um, the, the stalks were laid in order and she, she hid them and she made sure that those stalks were nicely laid again. Uh, and you have a picture of a woman, uh, Proverbs chapter 31, gathering her flax in due time and harvesting it. It's not an easy crop to get the flax from. But here was a woman who had gathered her flax and had very neatly laid it out on her roof to dry. And if they, she had just said to the spider, well, go up to the roof and hide yourselves under the flax, they could never rearrange the flax so that uh, it was obvious that the, oh, it didn't look as if there was anybody under there. It would be impossible to do it. So she went, she hid them, and carefully put the flax stalks back so it, it didn't appear to be anybody there. Now, flax, we see flax being grown in this country because of the seeds, but uh, in the Middle East it was grown for the fibres that come from flax. It grows about four feet high um, and has to be plucked up by the roots, put into bundles, and then those bundles have to be laid in the sunshine. uh, And after a long period in the sunshine... They then have to be immersed in water to soften the outer shell. And then, having been put into water, they then have to be taken out and put into the sunshine again. And then beaten in order to break the outer shell. Because underneath the outer covering of of the stalks lies these many strands like flaxen hair. And these are what they spin together to make thread, either used for sewing, or those threads are then woven together to make string, to make rope, uh, or to be woven to make garments. Flax is stronger than cotton. It doesn't quite have the elasticity of cotton. And I think it's so wonderful in the story that hidden underneath the flax on her house were these two Israelites. Because I think flax is a wonderful symbol to us of the work of redemption. Flax has to be plucked up by the roots, and often that's what God does to us, doesn't he? He plucks us up by the roots, and we have to be exposed to the sunshine, the action of God, the word of God directed upon us, And then that flax, having been in the sunshine for several months, then has to be immersed in water. And having been immersed in water, it then has to be again exposed to sunlight. And there has to be beaten in order to break this outer fibre. And what a wonderful parable that is, brothers and sisters, of our walk in the truth. God plucks us up, turns us around, exposes us to his word. And with the words and washing of the water, and then the experience of taking the word in and the trials and tribulations of life, then can be exposed these many fibres which can be woven together. And that's what an ecclesia is, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Uh, many fibres woven together to make a community. Uh, and what is it that we're working towards? Well, it's to be part of that white-robed multitude whom God will reveal, the Lord Jesus will reveal when he comes back. Now, the natural colour of flax uh, linen is uh, between shades of ivory. I can't read my writing on that, it's too small. Ecru, um, tan or grey. Pure white linen is created by heavy bleaching. Now today that's done chemically. But in time past, 
in order to bleach the linen having been woven into the cloth, it was pegged out in the fields on the grass and exposed to sunlight for months. <coughs> but it didn't need just sunlight. It had to be constantly wetted. Several times a day, you had to go out, you had to wet that cloth. So water, or the word, and the sunlight, the God working in our lives, bleaches the linen and produces the whiteness that one needs for white raiment. So, you know, as I say, I think it is wonderful that in this little story, here is a Gentile being turned around and being exposed to the things, the hope of Israel. There she has, hidden under her flax, these two Israelites. So, she hides them. And a good job she did. She goes back down, knock on the door, king's messengers. Um, and uh, we read in verse 3, The king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out the country. Uh, and she had already hidden them. And so she said, Oh, yes, men came. She didn't deny it because she knew that they'd been seen entering her house. But said, well, when the time came for shutting the gate, what time they shut the city gate, we've no idea, but it would be probably fairly late at night, they had slipped out. Go and search. Overtake them. You'll get them. And to her relief, they accepted her word. They didn't suspect anything. Uh, and they went and uh, searched for the men outside, and the city uh, gate was reshut as the... Uh, soldiers went out they didn't bother to explore her house but she knew that they would be watching her front door they were so on edge that there was no way that these so these spies who had come to her house could go out of her front door unseen so she realizes that uh, the spies were still in danger. They needed to leave. Uh, again, we see her faith. She goes back up to them and talks to them. And pleads with them. She explains to them that, you know, the kings have sent messengers that are on alert. They're searching for them. So you've got to get out of the city, but you can't go out by the front door. Um, but before you go, I need to talk to you. And she declares her wonderful understanding. These verses are just so wonderful, aren't they? Here's a Gentile woman, never probably ever spoken to an Israelite. But from all her observations and from the news that would come to her house as men came to her and would tell her what had happened in the, across in the east, she developed this understanding that Israel's God was the one and only and true God and that the whole of the country, the Canaanite country, was under sentence of death because the Israelites were going to come and conquer. And so she makes this, this declaration of faith. I know that Yahweh has given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how Yahweh dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites, which were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For Yahweh your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. And you can imagine the astonishment of these spies who come in to this Jericho house. And here is a woman who got more faith than their men back uh, at the camp. Believed in Israel's God as the creator of heaven and earth. Takes us back to Genesis, doesn't it? In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And it's a fascinating phrase to search out. Uh, God of heaven and earth. It occurs quite a lot of times and in nearly all those cases it is in reference to gentiles either gentiles using the words as here 
or words addressed to Gentiles. The first case occurs in Genesis when Abraham is talking to Eliezer, his steward from Damascus, and non-Jew, uh, but it was his steward, and instructing him about getting a son for um, Abraham. And he uses this phrase, the God of heaven and earth. And when we come to the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 14, where it tells us what the everlasting gospel will be preached to the Gentiles when the Lord Jesus comes back and the battle of Armageddon uh, in Israel has taken place and the gospel then goes out to the ends of the earth. It's fear God and give glory to him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. So it's a fascinating phrase to trace through scripture. And here is Rahab acknowledging that Israel's God is the God of heaven and the God of the earth. And because of that, because of her understanding that they were under sentence of death, she pleads with them for her life. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by your way, since I have showed you kindness, that you will show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. Interestingly, there was an occasion, going to be centuries later, when roles, as it were, were going to be reversed. Here is a Gentile pleading to Israelites for salvation because they're under sentence of death. Can you think of an instance when that role is reversed and when a Jew pleads to a Gentile for life? That's right, Esther. Esther, I'll just put the verse up there. Let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request, for we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed and to be slain and to perish. So whether there's any link between the two or whether it's just a coincidence that one is a Gentile pleading to an Israelite and here we have a Jew pleading to her Gentile husband for life, I don't know interested in your comments. Also, at the same time that Rahab was developing her faith, we also have the Gibeonites. Now, I'm sure that the Gibeonites had been watching all that had been happening, and they then saw the overthrow of Jericho, which lay another 14 days, 16 days on from where we are now, and had seen the fall of Ai, and they too came to this understanding. Gentiles recognised that they were under the sentence of death. They had heard the words that the Israelites had spoken on Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal and recognised that they were under the sentence of death. These people were going to conquer them. And they too took steps to try to save their lives, to fall upon the mercy of the God of Israel. Uh, and I think this is the great lesson that comes out from these incidents, that God is a merciful God. He has sentenced them all to death. But if people are prepared to show faith and works and do something about it, he will listen. He will give them life. And we know how the Gibeonites, they were spared and they became the temple Nethanim, and very important in the days of David and Solomon, very faithful um, in the helping in the temple worship. So let's just revisit this. So Rahab has declared her understanding of Israel's God to these two spies, who, as I say, must have been absolutely overwhelmed by this outpouring of faith from this woman. And she says, Spare me and give me a true token. Our word for token is an interesting one. It occurs quite a lot in scripture. Um, it's uh, a flag, a beacon, a monument, and it's translated a mark, a miracle, an ensign, or a token. And it's used as a visible sign of invisible words. Uh, and God gave the rainbow as a token of the words he has spoken, the Noahic covenant, there is the rainbow as a token to remind you of what I have spoken. 
And circumcision, the same word is used. Circumcision was given as a token of the Abrahamic covenant. A reminder when they circumcised their children of the great promises which God made. So this is what she was asking for, some token of their um, veracity, uh, that they would do what she wanted them to do. Now, it's just an interesting link back to Genesis 38. It isn't the same word, I have to admit, but I believe it has the same sense, that Tamar asked a pledge from Judah that he would deliver uh, some payment for the services rendered. She wanted a token from him, and we know how that saved her life. Um, a true token, uh, and the word means certainty, truth, trustworthy, uh, and from that word comes aman, and from that word aman we get amen. So, yay, truth. She wanted something which they would give her, which would be a sign to her that they would keep her word. We'll come back to that. Now, the spies tested Rahab's faith to the limit because Rahab lets them down through the window without receiving the true token. She'd asked for one, and the spies hadn't given her one. It's only when she had let them down through the window, down a rope um, over the city wall, that they then give her the token. Now, the word for... Uh, the cord that they let her down, that's nothing to do with the token. Completely different word. So the rope which she was let down um, is uh, a cord, a rope as twisted. Um, and Ecclesiastes has this lovely phrase, if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. And in fact, this picture is of a threefold cord. It, Every third chord is the same one. So many fibres spun into individual chords and then three chords of the same thickness put together make an extremely strong rope. And that's what they were let down from the window. So the city wall was pretty high uh, and let down to the ground. Uh, and then we have this bizarre conversation. They've let the, she's let the two spies down uh, and they have this conversation outside the city wall where they're being hunted outside, but uh, this conversation from the spies at the bottom on the ground and Rahab up at the window. If we just look at uh, verses 16 to 21. Um, so verse 15 says she lets them down by the cord. And then she says, get you to the mountains, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide yourselves three days until the pursuers be returned. Afterward you may go your way. Men said to her, we shall be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window by which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brother and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. Whosoever would, shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any harm, uh, if any hand be upon him. And if thou utter this our business, then we'll be quit of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. And she says, according unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away. So this bizarre conversation, and at the end of it, they then bind this scarlet thread, I believe, to the bottom of the rope, and she hauls the rope up, because it would never do to leave the rope dangling from the window. There would be a complete getaway in the morning. So it's interesting, we're about the seventh of the month, so there'll be a half moon, um, and this bizarre conversation takes place. They had, she had to keep the spy's mission secret, and she had to bind this thread into the window. So where did that scarlet thread come from? 
Uh, this is why I suggest it links back to Genesis 38. If Salmon was indeed one of the two spies, then the scarlet threads we can see would be a family heirloom. It was the mark of the firstborn. And although the scarlet thread hadn't been attached round the right person's baby's hand, it was withdrawn, and the other one was the firstborn, who was the great-great-great-grandfather uh, of Salmon. You can imagine that the uh, midwife, when on down that thread, would give it to the mother, and I believe that the mother handed it to her firstborn as a treasure, perhaps kept in a little pouch to keep it safe, and handed on from generation to generation to the firstborn. We know that Salmon was the firstborn of Judah at this time. Uh, and so the spies, when uh, Rahab asked for a true token, they wouldn't have much in their pockets. They were spies. They weren't going to have any incriminating evidence. But if Salmon was carrying the scarlet thread, then when he had seen the faith of Rahab, not only the declaration up there, but that she was prepared to let them down to the ground without receiving the token, then he was prepared to part with that precious thread, which meant so much to him, it meant nothing to anybody else. So let's look at this. So verse 18, bind this line of scarlet thread in the window. So line uh, can be a cord, but it's not a big fat cord like the rope. Um, it is a thread, uh, and that's what is used for sewing. So it's something very small, a, a thread, um, like we've got across the Bible, and the threads we know that run through Scripture. And it was a scarlet thread. And the word for scarlet, crimson, comes from... It, it's the same word can apply to the insect from where the scarlet crimson dye comes from or from the dye itself and you have to look at the context to see whether it's talking about the insect or the uh, colour that comes from it. Now we know there's a wonderful significance in the scarlet thread, the scarlet colour because Psalm 22 which is a deeply messianic psalm the Lord Jesus says of himself I am a worm and no man a reproach of men and despised of the people. Uh, and what he's referring to there is this little grub, this toweler, uh, the grub from which the scarlet dye comes. We call it today Coccus elysis. It's one of the scale insects. And its life history is so amazing. Because when the female is ready to lay her eggs... She goes to a particular type of tree, it's an oak tree, but a particular species, and locks herself onto it. You can't remove her. She's not going to move. She's going to die in that position. She lays her eggs under her, protecting them. The eggs hatch, uh, and eventually she dies. They start eating her. And... In dying, she extrudes this dye, which not only covers her body, but the babies and the tree. And what people do is to remove these dead bodies of the females uh, in order to grind up to extract this dye. But the interesting thing is... Um, if the body isn't removed, then after about three days, that scarlet crimson fluid turns white. And in fact, they then do gather that and use it as shellac, which is uh, a wood preservative. So what's all that got to do with Rahab? Well, it's a wonderful symbol of redemption. The scarlet thread was the mark of the firstborn of Judah, pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the greatest firstborn prince of Judah. 
And Rahab was saved by that scarlet thread. And by marrying Salmon, she was brought into the line of the descent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Lord Jesus was fastened to the tree. He gave his life, didn't he? And his, as it were, come out of the pierced side of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as Eve was taken out of the side of Adam, so the bride of Christ is taken out of the side of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is through his blood that we have redemption. So we have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And after three days, he rose to life again white robed and promises to give white robes of everlasting life to a multitude of people Uh, revelation 7 verses 13 and 14 speaks about the multitude of white robed redeemed ones who've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb so a wonderful type of the redemption that rahab was entering into So when we go back to the New Testament and we look at those two references and we read them in the light of all of that, by faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she received the spies with peace. So the rest of the inhabitants of Jericho didn't believe. She believed and so she was saved. But it's interesting what James says She was justified by works when she had sent them out another way. She hadn't sent the spies out the way they came through the front door. She had sent them out through the window and thus saved their life. So again, it's interesting, you know, brings these references to the New Testament to life. So they went another way, another route. So, that was the faith. She says to them, get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide yourselves three days until the pursuers be returned. Afterward, ye may go your way. So, she sent them out another way. But a little thread in the window, so high up, how would the spies be able to see it? Well, we're not told that it was a sign for the spies to know which was the house. The record doesn't say that at all. That wasn't the purpose of the scarlet thread, to show the house. Because when the wall fell, there was only one house standing, and that was Rahab's. It didn't need any thread there to show which house it was. Now that thread was there for, well, the angel of death that would preserve that particular house. But, you see, you've got to think of it in terms of the Passover. Read again uh, verse 18 of chapter 2. You've got to bring in your mother, your house, into the house with you. Don't go out. That's the language of Exodus, isn't it, in the Passover. They had to go through the blood-sprinkled doorway and enter into the house and not go out until the morning. So this was Rahab's. Passing through the doorway um, was, instead of having blood sprinkled around the window, here was a scarlet thread, uh, which denoted the same thing. And the angel of death, which passed over the houses of the Israelites who had gone into the blood sprinkled doorway, likewise uh, went over the house of Rahab uh, and preserved it when all around fell to the floor. Um, 16 days later from this incident. So following the smile's departure, she loses no time to put that thread in the window. Her link with salvation was there to be seen. And she preaches to her family. And she convinces them to come. We read in chapter 6 that father and mother and brother. The interesting thing, it doesn't mention sisters. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the sisters didn't listen, because in Joshua chapter 2, when the spies repeat back to her about the instructions, they don't mention sisters either, but says, Father, mother, and your brothers come into the house. So they may well have been there, 
but aren't mentioned in chapter 6. And after three days hiding, they return, and uh, the next day they cross Jordan on the 10th of Abib. They go to Gilgal uh, for three days, and then the Passover on the 14th. On the 15th of Abib, then the manna ceases, and that marked the end of the 40 years wandering. And then seven days conquering, so about 16 days from the spies' departure, Jericho's walls fall, and Rahab is saved. Now it's interesting, when we come to Joshua chapter 6 and the account there, Joshua doesn't talk about spies going in. He instructs them um, before the city falls, only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in her house, because she hid the messengers which we sent. And then the city falls, and the house is there, and they're saved. Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive, and her household, all she had. She dwelleth in Israel even unto this day, because she hid the messengers, which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. And that's the, the word that the Bible uses of angels. We know that they don't have to be angels. That prophets can be um, uh, Angelos, uh, no, 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 these are Malachians, that's the New Testament, Malachs. So these two spies turn out uh, in the good hand of God, not to be spies, but God's messengers, that God has sent to save this woman of faith. I think that's so wonderful how that, that comes out. So let's for the third time just revisit these two New Testament references. So Hebrews says she received the spies with peace. James says when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. So James is picking up on this fact that these spies turn into God's messengers, messengers of salvation. Interestingly, those two words received are two completely different words in the Greek. Um, the Hebrews one is to accept. James is going to use the same phrase, to receive with meekness the engrafted word. So she accepted them. The, the word that uh, James used is to admit under your roof. And it's used of Martha receiving Jesus into her house and Zacchaeus receiving Jesus into his house to lodge. So different word, but meaning the same thing. But it's interesting how the, the messengers... Uh, it occurs in James. Our time is going fast. I knew this would go on. It was just a time for the earth. Angela, it just keeps on adding and adding. There are two chiasms in this chapter. If we take the chapter as a whole, it opens with Joshua sending two men. It closes with the two men returning to Joshua. It tells us about um, being pursued. Uh, and we understand why it took three days to pursue them and couldn't find them and gave up. Uh, they hide three days in the mountain. Rahab confesses her faith and requests a true token. And that's balanced by Rahab acts upon her faith and lets them down and binds the token to the window. So verse 14, our life or yours if you utter not our business. And they repeat it again, if you utter our business we'll be quit of the oath. So what lies in the middle of these verses 15 to 19 where she lets them down by the cord they give her the token and reinforces the message about remaining in the house and not declaring their business. So that, that's the central core, the faith of this woman and her redemption mirrored upon what happened 40 years earlier when they came out of Egypt, the remaining in the blood-sprinkled household. And we know the lesson that has for us, we have to remain in the household until the master comes and not go out of it. There's a shorter chiasm which just takes uh, 8 to 24, the confession of her. She says, I know that Yahweh has given you the land. And the spies go back and uh, tell Joshua, Yahweh has delivered them into our hands. They can see that everybody is afraid of them. Hide three days in the mountain and they hid, um, hid three days. Sorry, I shouldn't have any on there. 
Um, we will blame this of this thine oath, bind the scarlet thread in the window, and that's balanced by according to your words, and she binds the scarlet thread in the window. And so, again, making this emphasis, blood on their head if they go out the house, and blood on us if any in the house be harmed. And this is the promise. If we remain faithful in the household, the Lord Jesus will redeem us and give us the kingdom. If we go out and turn our back on the truth, then we go to our death. So, in summary then, outstanding faith gather from reports that she had heard regarding the power of Yahweh. She would have seen from uh, Jericho, we don't know which side of the city her house was, but uh, anywhere in the city, you'll be able to see the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud over the encampment across Jordan. And that must have been very dramatic. No other nation had such a sign as that pillar of fire at night time, giving them illumination and a cloud protecting them in the day. She would have heard reports of the manna that they picked up every day. She heard, she saw, she believed. And when she opened the door, or met the spies outside the door, we know not, but she recognised that this was a God-given opportunity to save herself and her family. And she risked her life. It would have been, if she had been found out, it would have been certain death for her and her family. So she had tremendous faith. She confesses her faith and pleads for her life. And uh, they agree. And test her faith by allowing themselves to be lowered down without that token. And then give her the token that she needs. And the family is saved. And there's so many types. Passover. The flax, the scarlet dye, the rope. I didn't mention that, did I? But the rope that they were let down by, you know, the Hebrew is tikvah. And that's the Israel national anthem, the tikvah, the message of hope. The hope of Israel, which we Gentiles embrace as Rahab did. Call of the Gentiles. And an outstanding example of faith and works. So... Uh, a wonderful lady who then became the mother of Boaz, raised up seed to Ruth the Moabites and their child Obed, the father of Jesse, the father of King David. A wonderful lady and in the mercy of God we shall be able to see her in the kingdom and share in the blessings of the kingdom. Thank you.